Uh, good evening. This is Maggie Klein. I welcome you to tonight's uh, Zoom program from the Manor Club. And uh, our guest tonight is uh, Mount Vernon Mayor Sean Patterson Howard. Over to you, Mayor. Good evening. Good evening so much, Ms. Klein. Um, I want to say thank you so much to the Manor Club for inviting me to come and speak with you tonight, um, just to give you some updates on Mount Vernon, as well as to answer some questions that you might have. Uh, do you wanna wait another minute or two for people or you wanna just dive right in? I think we dive right in. Okay, so, you know, I was sent a few kind of basic um, questions uh, around, you know, the status and the, the, well, the status of Mount Vernon. And uh, one of the first questions really addressed COVID and what is the state of COVID in Mount Vernon? What is, uh, you know, what have we dealt with? Um, what are we dealing with? And, and what do we see as some of the future issues around COVID? So, you know, COVID, all of us really were hit very early by COVID, definitely being next to New Rochelle. I think we had our first reported cases that we were aware of, that we became aware of in about March 9th in Mount Vernon. And it started off with our police, I mean, our fire department who had gone into one of our nursing homes. And uh, within a day, uh, four of our firefighters were positive and it went <laughs> from there. Um, COVID definitely impacted Mount Vernon uh, greatly. We will never, I don't think any of us as communities will ever know the full impact um, or the full rate of positivity because we know for the first few months it was very difficult to get a COVID test. Even if you were sick, um, as long as you could breathe uh, and half walk, you weren't necessarily eligible for a test or sometimes by the time you became, uh, a test became available, like at the New Rochelle drive-in testing center, people were feeling better and back to work. Um, so, you know, many of us found out that we had been exposed to COVID later on in May and June when we were able to get antibody tests. Uh, I had tested antibody positive, but I'd never necessarily been, you know, was sick or had to stay home. Thank God the rest of my family, no one else got it and uh, no one even tested antibody positive. But um, when it came to COVID, we had put together a COVID task force. We ran the city since last March on an incident command system where we broke up our city government into public safety, economic development, human services, uh, operations, finance, and <laughs> infrastructure. And uh, the chief of fire, which also oversees our EMS program in Mount Vernon, became our incident command manager and really tracked COVID for us throughout the community. We usually did weekly updates uh, about three times a week uh, and addressed the community on COVID. We had put together a uh, COVID compliance task force for the businesses to ensure that the businesses that were essential businesses and were allowed to be open, that they were remaining compliant because you know there was so much fear and people had concerns that businesses were not always following rules. And then we also had a social distancing task force, which helped to reinforce the rules in the community. Um, as we were moving towards reopening, we were able to take that COVID uh, business compliance or essential business task force and turn that into a resilience and reopening um, task force. And so with that task, that same task force, we worked with them to understand um, what their needs were going to be in order to reopen and stay compliant and file all of their reports and health reports with the state. Uh, and we really certified these businesses as um, resilient and strong, meaning that they were safe or as safe as could be for the community to use. I believe some of that work that we did during that time, educating our business community and working very closely with them allowed Mount Vernon's, um, you know, we, we don't have any malls. It allowed our business community to rebound much quicker really than the rest of the region. If you were to look at the state controller's reports, um, Mount Vernon, even the first quarter of this year, our sales tax uh, revenues and, and percentage of 
how we've we've done has outpaced Westchester County and most of the Hudson Valley. I think our sales tax taxes were up 10.8% for the first quarter of this year. And last year we finished um, our end of the year ahead of our projected sales tax collection um, rate. So we really did a lot of hard work. We knew that without having malls, most of our businesses were small independent mom and pop shops. Um, we know that these small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They spend money locally, they hire locally, uh, and they provide the essential services that our residents need. And so um, while we have seen some businesses close down, I think that's kind of, we, we didn't see a, a much higher rate than we see in Mount Vernon of businesses closing, um, but it also allowed us and it gave us an opportunity um, to address some of the laxity that we've seen over the years. That's making sure businesses were registered with the building department, that they had certificates of occupancy, certificates of tenancy, that they were registered as an official business with the New York State Comptroller's Office, um, and that they met all of the local city ordinances. So we provided that compliance and that technical assistance and we continue to do a lot of technical assistance, especially as restaurants can now pretty much be open at 100%. Um, and we found that a lot of our small businesses did not necessarily have the infrastructure around marketing uh, and around being able to do online business or delivery that they needed. And so we worked with the Business Council of Westchester, the Regional Economic Development Center, um, our, our local chamber, and our IDA to provide a lot of technical assistance to those businesses and helping them um, to skill up and, and develop some of the skills that they're going to need even going in the future um, to survive. Because if it's not COVID, it can be something else. And we wanna just make sure that those businesses are really stable and that they can endure um, another hit of one type or another. Um, and when it comes to Testing in Mount Vernon, we did not get testing until May of 2020. We were able to stand up a walk-up testing site at our federally qualified health center, the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Health Center. Um, you know, testing was eventually made available at Mount Vernon Hospital and our urgent care centers, several of our urgent care centers in Mount Vernon. And those are the primary ways for which we are now doing um, vaccinations. We do not have a permanent vaccination site yet, but we are seeing vaccinations um, becoming more readily available. Uh, we have utilized some of our churches as pop-up vaccination sites in working with the Governor's Equity Task Force, one, uh, our director of our health center, as well as one of our local pastors sit on the Governor's Equity um, and vaccination task force. So we've been able to kind of plug in, not to the level that any of us would want to because vaccinations have just been uh, hard to come by around the country. You know, in Washington, they make policy, but they don't necessarily do implementation and roll out well. And so we are no different than, and, and our region and our state's really no different as I speak to mayors across the country. Um, the rollout has been slow and, you know, they'll get a flood of vaccines one week and then the next week due to transportation, delivery, cross-contamination or something that happens with one of the big three providers, um, the numbers drop off. But we are really, really looking for vaccinations to flood the region within the next um, two to three weeks. So, you know, definitely by mid-May, not only Mount Vernon, but the state it should be much, much easier. Um, we'll go from famine to feast. And so I'm sure that will also um, trickle over and, and impact Pelham and the availability of vaccines in, in larger venues and more stable venues for your community as well. Uh, insofar as current COVID cases, you know, our numbers are low. They're back to the level of like July of last year. Um, just a few hundred active cases. And we speak about active cases. It's the number of people who are testing positive over a two week period. Um, at the height of the pandemic, I think we had as many as 180 confirmed tests in one day, in one day. And that I believe was about April 6th of last year. 
Um, and that was a lot for the number of people that were being tested. But um, I really think it's, it's stabilizing. We have not experienced, we've experienced one death in 2021 um, of, of a Mount Vernon resident. There might've been people who are not from Mount Vernon who you know, might pass in a hospital or, or a nursing home, but in so far as Mount Vernon residents um, in our community or in another hospital, in another community, we've, we've experienced one death so far this year. Um, we also track COVID through our EMS calls and the number of EMS calls that we're receiving um, has, has greatly reduced uh, as well as even the numbers of children that we're seeing infected in our school district is low. Uh, we are working with the Westchester County Office of Senior Services um, and the County Department of Health to deliver vaccines to our elderly and homebound populations. Um, and that has been really, really working out well. Uh, and with the Johnson & Johnson coming, back out, even though there was a hiccup in that. And I see the question about Memorial Field, even though there was a question, there was a hiccup in that. I think for me, it builds my confidence in the whole process of identifying if there's a flaw with the vaccine. And as soon as they saw a concern, they pulled it. And once they were able to test out the validity of the concern, then they were able to put it back into public use. And so for some people, you know, that says that's caused a, a vaccine hesitancy. I think in former times where there was less transparency, um, we may not have found out about this until a year later and larger numbers of people being affected. So um, hopefully that hasn't uh, impacted your confidence in, in any of the vaccines. Um, so Memorial Field, the status of Memorial Field um, we are still on track right now. I know it still looks like a lot of dirt being moved, um, but we are laying the plumbing and the electrical work. Con Ed is working with um, our architects and with uh, the contractors to get the electrical work done. Uh, we are on time right now to really see a major, um, major developments in the completion of the field by October or, or November of this year. Um, we've been told that the track and the field will be down the football field, the soccer field, the track will be down by then. They will have started um, the stands, uh, but we know different things happen with construction, but we don't believe that it's gonna be open and ready for use in the fall. We believe that will happen more in the spring of 22. Um, that's when we'll do our big ribbon cutting probably, but in October or November, we'll do a, uh, a, a soft launch and, and do some virtual tours to let the community see um, what's happening with Memorial Field. We are working very closely with Harvard University um, and Bloomberg Philanthropies right now to find the right revenue mix and use mix for Memorial Field. This is gonna be a $28 million stadium. Um, so clearly we want to make sure that it's available to the community, but in order for us to sustain and make sure we're able to provide the proper level of maintenance um, and capital repairs to it, we're going to have to ensure that we're bringing in revenue that is outside of city tax dollars. And so we're looking with some sports organizations um, who are interested in making Memorial Field home. And when I say sports organizations, it can be semi-pro teams down to some of our regional colleges that are saying they would like that to be their home field and we would enter contract. Um, but we're trying to do it in a way to be uh, mindful of our need to generate revenue, but also to ensure that this field that's been closed now for 11 years is still available for our community, you know, and public use for people who want to walk the track, for you know, community organizations that want to hold um, different type of events, cu cultural days, um, our local high school and and our youth uh, sports organizations to um, be able to utilize the field as well. And it's not going to be an easy balance, but it's a balance that we're going to have to find and and really strike and work through. We have, what is the status of Mount Vernon Hospital? Huh. Excuse me, Mayor, before you go any further, 
um, on Memorial Field. Is there any traffic studies planned as to how traffic will exit and enter that area? Yes, um, absolutely. We have been doing that with um, the projects ma managers, which is the county, um, Land Tech, which is the construction company. And why am I forgetting the name of the developers right now? It's it's leaving my mind, but um, you know, making sure that we have good access to the Hutch uh, and then Sanford Boulevard. Sanford Boulevard, um, you know, we know there will be some traffic as it was before Memorial Field closed that will come down through Pelham. But we are hoping, um, you know, that when it's a Mount Vernon crowd, for the most part, they're going to be utilizing. Um, the uh, Sanford Boulevard arterial, as well as Garden Avenue, um, Newber Avenue, and those blocks in that area, as well as the Hutchinson River Parkway um, exit eight entrance and exit. There will be some traffic that comes through Pelham, um, but we, you know, don't anticipate it being much more than when it was when the field was active. Now, on times where there's events, we're going to have to make special accommodations. Um, I don't think there's going to be, but so many events where we're using all 3,800 seats uh, on a regular basis, but there will be those events that happen. And with that, we will do planning with Pelham, um, you know, to make sure that we're able to address any of the traffic um, control concerns and, and to be able to mitigate the impact on, on both communities. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're not totally clogging up the Sanford Boulevard corridor because that's also an important business corridor for us. But, you know, I can imagine holidays um, around Christmas, it's already a very clogged um, corridor, but I, I, we'll, we'll have to do more. Um, honestly, we have not in, in this year of COVID, I, I almost feel like I haven't had an opportunity to be a mayor outside of COVID. Uh, COVID hit us about 70 days in. So a lot of things that we envision doing and looking at have been impacted by COVID um, and the other fatal C in our community, which is the controller. <laughs> so COVID and the controller have, have both been a challenge to kind of um, hitting my stride and finding a certain level of normalcy in Mount Vernon. Um, we're, we're dealing with some real uncharted waters and, and it is definitely um, of concern and an issue and not to have the cooperation of your um, financial manager for the city is, is uh, very concerning. And so even some of the traffic study work and, and updated traffic study work that we would do and some of the planning work we, that we're trying to do in Mount Vernon is hampered because we are not paying our consultants and, and that has been um, a bit of a challenge. That won't be a challenge after December, but the uh, distance between here and December still feels like me swimming to Milan, um, a really big divide to be able to cross. Um, the good news is she's not running again. Yes, excuse me. I'm sorry to dwell on the traffic, but most of your audience here is from Pelham. Absolutely. Manner. Um, do you plan to meet with the mayors of Pelham and Pelham Manor, or can they participate in some way with that traffic study? I, I definitely they, believe having a plan. And ask them to help pay for it. I'm talking out of school here, but. Uh, you know, I mean, it's so important. Well, that it might impact the Pelham border and Pelham. Uh, right. I think that, you know, they've had their COVID problems too, but this is so important to Pelham. Um, and I, I'm a believer in getting ahead of everything. So I'm just going to uh, suggest as someone who lives in New Rochelle, by the way, uh, that, uh, there may be an opportunity here to reach out to the mayors of Pelham and Pelham Manor and the town supervisor um, before it becomes a major problem. Like, I don't know if you remember what the Sanford Boulevard development became. 
the Target uh, business uh, became a real battle between the Pelhams and Mount Vernon years ago. I worked in the planning department <laughs> during those years. I'm, I'm very familiar. While I wasn't doing that work, uh, trust me, it was part of our weekly meetings. You know, so, you know, I'm just a believer in everybody talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of the mayors is, is at this meeting, but I'm, they can talk for themselves. But as an outsider, I'm just saying that sometimes if you all talk before you have the problem, you know, you solve some of the problems, not all of them. I'm sorry, you can now go ahead to your problems with your controller. <laughs> well, uh, Maggie, yeah. Mayor, if it's all right, uh, Mayor Chance Mullen in the village of Pelham, we can talk offline. Uh, I, I personally have, have been a real fan of yours and I think you came in I, I imagine it has been challenging with the the, uh, the things you've been facing, but I think you've done an outstanding job. We'll, we'll talk offline and, and figure it out. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I've been in contact a lot with um, Omar, uh, doing doing a lot of work. So apps, you know, with without a without a doubt, I'd rather have conversation than litigation any day. Um, and <laughs> you know, it saves time. It 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 keeps relationships, um, and it allow it, it allows us to really solve the problem. And and that's what I want to do is I want to speak to the concerns because it's not just a concern for the residents of Pelham, but it's definitely a concern for those who live in that neighborhood. You know, they've always missed Memorial Field, but they've missed the Memorial Field. They could just go walking in and playing tennis. They don't necessarily miss the memorial field of graduation and football games and community cultural activities or concerts or anything of that nature. What I can tell you is that we're not installing a big multi-million dollar sound system so that concerts, it, it becomes the regional concert venue. So we're not looking for it to be that. Okay, so that, that might help to allay some of your fears, nor um, do I plan on having big uh, splash fests at Hutchinson Park either, <laughs> where, where you experienced a lot of um, noise there. So those, those are things that are not on our um, planning schedule, you know, what we might be looking to do more of down at Hutchinson Field is to continue to expand that and bring back the baseball fields there and some of the other outdoor activities and kind of make sure that area is our, our sports um, and cultural art, arterial, uh, which would also kind of blend in with what's happening, um, not at Scouts Field, not Cook, what's the name of the field down there? where you have your track and you have your baseball field. Glover. Glover, Glover Field. Excuse me, I'm thinking some of my, I'm like Cook Field, though that's Yonkers, but 13 years in Yonkers will do that to you. Um, so yes, that's, that's you know, some of the plans that we're making um, down in that area. And, you know, maybe some more, more economic development in the area of Best Buy um, and, and Target, we have some people who are interested in bringing a hotel down there, a family hotel, a smaller family hotel, um, especially to complement um, Memorial Field. So if you have teams coming in, they might have a place to go. Um, but we also do need a small hotel in Mount Vernon, but we're not looking to do a big high rise or a big development down there, but something that we can do still within that footprint of um, Target and, and Best Buy. So those are some, you know, cause that was one of the questions. What about economic development on the border of Pelham? I'm not looking to do really loud things on the border of Pelham. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's not the plan. We're not opening up a playground or uh, not a playground, a, a uh, amusement park or anything like that but it would be something more um, sports and, and arts and cultural that we're looking to do um, on that end. I just wanna look, we asked about COVID, economic development there. Um, there was a question here about Mount Vernon, our, our size, uh, you know, our population. 
uh, Mount Vernon, while it says 67,000 on the census, we are absolutely um, 100,000 plus strong. Uh, I, we, we have lots of huge houses in Mount Vernon as you do in Pelham and lots of those houses have been changed into two or three. Some have cut them up and um, you know, brought in tenants in, in an SRO or a basement fashion. And this is something we've been talking about in the Westchester Municipal Officers Association that especially in our, our larger, sometimes uh, homes in our very well-established communities um, as people have faced increasing economic challenges, even prior to COVID, many of them have kind of taken on friends and family or even um, built subunits within their home to bring in income. And this is something that we're continuously finding, um, whether we find it uh, at the scene of a fire or if we're doing um, inspections or dealing with some type of code compliance or a complaint from a neighbor. Um, and also we've put in new water tracking systems. And so, you know, as we see increased usage and increase in bills, we start asking questions and, you know, did you double the number of people you have living here? Um, especially if someone's water bill is doubled and they don't call us to complain, we know it's because they've taken on extra people in their home because anyone whose water bill has doubled and they don't complain, they're usually kind of hiding something. And so we're, we're really um, doing more around data collection so that we can understand more as to what is happening in our city and the different growing needs of our city and being able to identify and track that. Um, Mount Vernon is still about 64% African-American. Uh, about 20% Hispanic Latino, we have a, a rapidly growing and it might be larger than that Hispanic Latino population um, and about 16% um, Caucasian uh, Asian, uh, but we're still a majority minority um, community. Um, but within that, you know, we still have over 90 nationalities of people living in Mount Vernon. So there's diversity even within um, those large groups of, of where those people hail from. So very, very diverse community, um, still with strong Italian, um, Brazilian, Portuguese, and, and Irish communities, um, still a very solid Caribbean community. And we're seeing, uh, like we said, an increase in the diversity of the Hispanic Latino community, um, you know, not just Dominicans and Mexicans, but more people from Colombia and, and Central America are moving within the community. Um, the controller issue is very real. <laughs> um, she's not paying bills, she's bouncing checks and she's double paying some of the vendors that she does pay. Um, so that is a real challenge. We have, you might've seen different things on TV about us um, developing workarounds. And we are working with the city council um, to create workarounds because uh, she's blocking federal money from coming into the city. We had $15 million of HUD funds that came through the COVID CARES Act that were to help with eviction prevention, small business um, stabilization, um, you know, food insecurity that she was holding up. Uh, we have sent that money now through the clerk's office and then it goes straight to the Urban Renewal Agency where it was always intended to go with our American Rescue Monies. Um, we're gonna bring that in. We've created a separate account in the clerk's office, a separate bank account. The clerk's office is the only office in the city that has the same EIN and DUNS number. So our municipal authorities like the Urban Renewal Agency, the Industrial Development Agency and the Board of Water Supply are their own separate entities with their own EIN numbers and their own DUNS numbers. So we have to bring it in through the city clerk and then reroute the money. Um, and the Board of Water Supply is the place where we'll bring in our American rescue monies and our FEMA reimbursement monies, which we're hoping will be about 8 million in just FEMA reimbursements um, for all of the overtime and the different services, <coughs> excuse me. talk a lot, your voice don't get dry. <coughs> the different services we've been providing. <coughs> I don't have COVID. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. 
you hate to cough because people look at you like, oh my goodness. <coughs> A little bit of allergies. <coughs> so, um, but we've put extra financial precautions in place <coughs> because the border, water supply usually does not go through the same financial controls as regular departments. But for American rescue monies and FEMA monies, we've put those controls in place. So there's checks and balances and accountability, <coughs> you know, to answer the concerns of the residents. Um, and so, hospital. Mount Vernon Hospital. So we are really trying to give the governor an opportunity to publicly change his mind because he has always supported <coughs> the closing of the hospital. And he has not, <coughs> well, I'm so sorry, he has not stepped in. But with all of the conversation around COVID, with the conversation around health disparities, with the conversations around the need for equitable medical care, um, this really provides him an opportunity to be that champion and saying, you know, look, before COVID, these are the ways we were looking to regionalize healthcare, but we understand a community like Mount Vernon that is largely my majority minority definitely needs a hospital. I have been meeting with the CEO of Montefiore Hospital um, to discuss with him, really um, helping to mine some of the data. Montefiore has contended that Mount Vernon residents don't use Mount Vernon Hospital. I said, it's very hard to do that when you've pretty much gutted the hospital of some of its major services and people don't wanna piecemeal their medicine. People are very busy and they wanna be able to go to one place that has comprehensive healthcare. I, when I moved back to New York um, after college and getting married, uh, we went to Kaiser Permanente <laughs> up on Westchester Avenue and they have a lot of comprehensive care. And, and I think, you know, inpatient care has been through White Plains Hospital and people really want a, a one-stop shopping center. And if they have a very special need, then they'll do regional health care. Um, one thing, the, the thing that Montefiore, like I said, has always contended is that we don't use the hospital. I said, but we use your healthcare system. And why would we go to Monte Moses, Wakefield, Nourishell, St. John, St. Joseph's and White Plains if we didn't have confidence in Monte? What we don't have, in, have confidence in is the level of services um, which are disparate at best that you're providing at the Mount Vernon site. So uh, that's the one thing I've asked. I said, I, I would like a zip code study because they give me the zip codes of everyone who uses Mount Vernon Monte and shows us that it's not Mount Vernon residents. I said, well, let's see. And then they also say Mount Vernon residents um, don't have private health care coverage, um, enough private health care coverage to support a hospital. And again, that's not true because we are using all of your other facilities and I'm sure it's not just Medicaid and Medicare. We're using private health insurance at your other facilities. And so, you know, the CEO came in pretty much right around the time that I came in after the decisions had been made and, and we're trying to move forward with those. But he says that he's really not tethered to that decision and wants to step back. And so we're using this American Recovery and Rescue Plan time um, and some of the federal funding that's coming down to really uh, work with Congressman Bowman as well as um, Senator Schumer and um, our state senators and Senator Gillibrand uh, and our state senators and assembly people to really identify how we can um, earmark money to get Mount Vernon Montefiore back on track. Uh, if Montefiore continues to decide that they wanna pull out of Mount Vernon, we're saying no problem, that is absolutely your option, but we are asking the New York State Department of Health not to allow them to take the operating certificate for the hospital. 
Um, so if they pull out of Mount Vernon and they're not allowed to take the operating certificate and that operating certificate remains with the State Department of Health um, for the city of Mount Vernon, then we're able to shop that around to another medical provider um, and, and work with them to come in. And so that's another thing that we're working with Bloomberg on, um, working with Bloomberg, John Hopkins, and, and um, Robert Wood Johnson uh, to really identify because these are organizations, again, that are talking about health, health equity, a culture of health in a community. And Mount Vernon is, is we're, we're 100,000 strong. We're in need of a hospital. And when I said, actually, when I was running, and it's proven true um, since then is as we've been regionalizing healthcare, we've been losing beds in our region. And so if you go over to Lawrence Hospital right now, the wait in the emergency room is much longer and there are people increasingly complaining about the quality of care. Um, some of you might go over to New Rochelle Hospital. We've had you know, increasing concerns and complaints about the quality of care and the wait times um, at New Rochelle. So I said, as they decrease what they're offering in Mount Vernon, it's not like they're going to double up on what they're offering in other communities. They're slowly decreasing the services in those hospitals also, and the quality and the accessibility um, of our healthcare in this region is going to decline. We cannot be the feeder communities to um, maintain Monty or any other hospital system that comes out of New York City and kind of wants to get their claws into um, pulling out services from our community and making us travel further or settle for lesser services um, in the region. They're doing a lot. They're doing a lot to invest in White Plains but they are decreasing services in Mount Vernon before that was to the benefit of New Rochelle Hospital, but we're seeing that they're doing similar things in New Rochelle Hospital right now and eliminating certain specialties and, um, and that like, again, the quality of services are declining. And so, you know, you have Mount Vernon on one border for you, you have New Rochelle Hospital on the other border for you. And, um, you know, hopefully this is a concern, not just for our communities, but for how it impacts the availability of health care for your residents in Pelham and Pelham Manor as well. Uh, Mayor, um, we have a question here that someone says there was a big drug bust that just happened in Mount Vernon. I don't know anything about that. Um, maybe you don't either. Well, I was away for a few days <laughs> and they, well, I get the, I get the police reports for every tour report. And so did not necessarily get information on any major, major drug bust, not anything of kind of ATF or FBI level. I mean, a major drug bust in Mount Vernon, it might be major for Pelham and Pelham Manor, but not necessarily for us. We do have a very aggressive violent crimes and street crimes unit. Um, that has been doing an outstanding job in um, getting some of the guns and illegal guns off the street, um, probably at higher rates because they are out there and they're pursuing them. Um, but I will follow up. I'm taking notes over here. I will look into that and get back to you. That's all right. I'm sure it'll be in the paper if it actually happens. <laughs> okay. I did read uh, that you had a string of resignations in the police department and- Absolutely. I mean, at, at a much higher rate than usual. And so one of the biggest issues, look, Mount Vernon, it's, it's interesting when we go to the academy for the county, everyone says, oh, don't go work for Mount Vernon. It's a rough community. Why go there? It's not a good police department. And last year when every community was unable to hold their civil service exams, when the county wasn't able to hold an, county, uh, an academy to replenish different communities, and then especially when the governor put out his police reform plan and really challenged communities to diversify their police force, the easiest place for them to come and one of the only places for them to come was to Mount Vernon. 
And so, yes, that that is the cause because everyone has met their diversity goals on the back of our police department because we had the most diverse police department and our police officers are very experienced. They're very skilled. Um, they're very well trained and, and trained in a lot of the advanced community techniques and, and police prevention, intervention and restorative justice techniques. So even Westchester County themselves came down and in one round took seven officers and um, in the next week they'll be taking another round of officers, Greenberg, White Plains, New Rochelle, you know, Rye, um, Croton, everyone has come and really recruited. And so we went from probably having the most diverse police force um, or, or the highest percentage of black and brown officers in the region now to not having them. So they're not just taking police officers and it's not just police officers that are resigning or transferring. It is our black and brown police officers that are transferring because they are specifically being targeted and recruited. And when the county um, can offer you $30,000 more a year or New Rochelle can offer you $15,000 more a year, um, it's, it's not a hard decision to make. It's, it's not a hard decision to make, especially if you have a young family. And so um, it's not just mass exodus of, of resignations. We generally get about 15 to 20 on a year. And that's, you know, people coming in, people transferring. And then a lot of people um, come into our police department to transfer in the first place. It's a shorter list. It's an easier list to get into. And, and we've always had a higher, high number of transfers because they'll come in and they already have designs to transfer over into another department within two or three years. But then specifically with the police reform goals, um, not having a contract since you know December, 2017 and having a controller who you're not sure if she's going to pay you or not, you know, those, that also added to the exodus of police officers in the department. Um, and so we are, having an exam in May. I think that'll be the first time Mount Vernon has had an exam since 2016. So even the list that we had within the city was old and we were at the very bottom of our list and that list has been expended and it's expired. Um, and so for our last class of recruits, we had to go to the Westchester County list. Um, and if you saw a picture of that class, there was nothing about it that was diverse at all. Uh, and not one of them were Mount Vernon residents. And so it is a real challenge. It is one of the challenges that we've inherited. Um, and we are looking to do a police contract as we are for all of our other unions. Um, but it's, it's, it's gonna be a hard hill to come back from. And uh, I don't think that the people are finished yet, but, you know. Literally, I have people who kind of maxed out at top pay in Mount Vernon were able to go into the county at a step three for $30,000 more. And there are two more steps that they could advance on financially. Um, and, and it's not going to be able to, easy to keep people um, when there's that level of disparity in pay. And that's not a, a bridge that we're going to be able to close overnight. It's, it's just not. How long is your term? Four years. Four years. <laughs> well, you sound like you're really up to the challenges and uh, <coughs> going forward, you're, you're prioritizing well, your challenges here? <clears throat> yeah, we are definitely. <clears throat> I don't even know if you can say you're prioritizing your challenges um, because if you have 12 gates to the city and you have uh, enemies approaching and coming into eight of them, <laughs> you have to cover all eight of them. So whether it's policing um, reform, whether it is our sewers, um, hundred years, uh, hundred miles of sewage that uh, our sewers and our storm drains we know right now it's gonna cost us over 125, $150 million um, for those. Um, our, our bridges, we are kind of getting better with the bridges. We will be finishing in May 
uh, another two bridges and, and those will be able to reopen. And, you know, there are 11 bridges and at one time, seven of those 11 bridges were down at the same time. So in order for ambulances to just get across the railroad track, they would have to be diverted five blocks in one way, cross the bridge and then come back five blocks, you know, 10, 12 blocks adds on and, and decreases the response time of fire, police, uh, and EMS, but we have seen the 6th Avenue Bridge reopen, the 14th Avenue Bridge reopen, the 3rd Avenue and the 10th Avenue Bridge are almost finished now and should reopen before May is over. One of them was trying to promise me Mother's Day. I live on South 3rd Avenue, my mother lives on North 3rd Avenue, and I said for Mother's Day it would be so nice to just walk straight down the street and cross the bridge and bring her some flowers. He said, Miss Mayor, I'd love to be able to do that to you, but I can't guarantee it. But look, by Father's Day, I'll be able to cross the bridge <laughs> and say hello to my dad. Uh, and, and that might sound like a small feat, but really when you have a railroad cut that is, is in an official environmental red line in your community and um, you kind of have a tale of two communities because of it and then you have bridges um, that have been down longer than 10 years. Um, it, it impacts the culture and the confidence in government um, that the community has. And so, you know, hopefully as we're able to fix these bridges and really start addressing some of the sewage issues and, and paving our roads, you know, the, just the basic services, um, the confidence in government will come back. It, it has not been easy for Mount Vernon residents. I don't think it's been easy. I have been a Mount Vernonite all my life, except for when I went away to college in DC. My you know, family's been here since 1862 and my great grandparents are buried in St. Paul's Cemetery. Um, my grandfather was the first person of color to work in city hall, even be it you know, as a cleaner. He was very proud and, and he, you know, broke some barriers and, and I am breaking barriers, but we have a long history of service, whether it's in police or fire, civil service, volunteerism, civic engagement. Um, so I grew up in a Mount Vernon that I don't recognize any longer. Um, I'm committed to my, my daughter's here still, she's 29 and she says, you know, mom, I was looking at moving to New York City, but if you're able to bring in housing for young professionals like myself who want some nice amenities and things of that nature. I, I really would like to stay here to be with you and, and to be close to my grandparents. And we're hearing that a lot from our young professionals. We're doing a lot to invest in, in our millennials um, right now. We have a very strong economic base within that community. And we opened up a all market rate house uh, building on the question Parkway with rents of, you know, 25 to $3,500 a month. And 85% of the people who are living in there are Mount Vernon residents who are millennials, who are professionals. And they're on the waiting list for the other three buildings that are scheduled to open down there. So we do have a market. And I think oftentimes Mount Vernon is presented as a, as a poor community. We absolutely have a higher percentage of those who are impoverished um, in Mount Vernon than we do some of our other Southern Westchester communities. But we also have um, a strong, you know, working class and a strong middle class. And we have some really good pockets of wealth. And, and I don't think that as a community, we've planned for them. Um, most of the development that has happened and housing development that's happened in Mount Vernon over the last 20 years has been led um, kind of by our church community development corporations, and they've all built senior housing, um, affordable senior housing. And we haven't done much to invest in market rate housing. We have not taken advantage mm -hmm. of our, um, uh, you know, being a, having, you know, three train stations on two different train lines and, and being a transit oriented hub here. In, in the region. And uh, so we are increasing some of our market rate projects um, to bring in more market rate projects because we need to bring people into Mount Vernon who after paying their rent, they have uh, additional income so that they could eat and be entertained and shop in Mount Vernon. But then that also requires us to have more than 
um, nail salons, hair shops, and, and dollar stores as well. Uh, I, I don't have an easy time buying work clothes in Mount Vernon. I just don't because there's not anywhere to go. I might be able to go get a ball gown at one or two of our stores, but just being able to go get a suit um, and and day-to-day -day work clothes or church clothes, I can. I can get urban gear and I can get a ball gown. Um, but we have to diversify the business offerings in Mount Vernon. Uh, and I just honestly feel our government's been lazy. I, I, I'm not trying to be disparaging or nasty, but I just don't think that we've thought out the box We've allowed everyone else to dictate what's going to be here as opposed to creating a plan and developing the necessary partnerships to bring that in. I think the last innovative thing that happened was Sanford Boulevard and um, bringing in some of the big box stores. But when it's come to Fourth Avenue, when it's come to Mount Vernon Avenue um, and Gramerton Avenue, we have not worked with, nor do we have a strong chamber of commerce to really be engaged with us in that planning. But um, we are working with the Business Council of Westchester and the Regional Economic Development Center. And we are, are building out our real estate committee. And we're going to create some new ordinances um, and, and rules and policies in Mount Vernon around um, property owners who are renting because they just rent, they charge very high rents um, there's a grand opening and a quiet closing because people can't sustain the rents. And for these property owners, for those uh, properties to be vacant, it doesn't hurt them. It actually benefits them, but it, it increases blight and open spaces in, in some of our um, commercial corridors. And we have to find a way to close those loopholes um, and be more intentional and strategic and, and larger thinking about how to bring business into Mount Vernon and how to um, help it thrive and for our community to grow. And I think some of that will also happen as a part of the comprehensive planning process. And we have not adopted a comprehensive plan since the year of my birth in 1968. And I think I've changed since I was born and I think Mount Vernon has changed over 52 years and we have to be um, intentional about, about smart growth here. If we don't, we cannot lose and miss out on another development and business cycle in Mount Vernon. We are gritty and we've kind of clawed our way through and survived. But if we don't do something very different now, um, it's going to be a challenge. And so uh, I sit on the African American Mayor's Association's Board of Trustees. I do sit on the um, United States Conference of Mayors. Um, Economic Development Committee. And uh, I'm, I sit on the nominating committee for NICOM. And now that they're starting back up, I will push into that. But, you know, really utilizing some of those supports from those organizations um, to bring those critical planning supports um, into Mount Vernon and find out what other main streets around the country have done to revitalize themselves. So I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. I just think we have to stop acting as if we're such a unique community that no one else can tell us what to do. It's about the relationships that we are establishing and will leverage to really help us. And then not going so far as across the country, but really working um, right here in Westchester and within the Hudson Valley uh, area with, with our regional um, leaders and mayors and towns and villages um, to develop that those relationships. And as COVID calms down some more, I really am looking forward to, to reaching out and being able to visit and walk through the community, see what's happening, bring, you know, have, have that cross-pollinization um, because it can't continue to be adversarial. We can't continue to act like Pelham and Pelham Manor and New Rochelle and White Plains and Yonkers and Porchester are all out to get Mount Vernon. I think that all of these communities um, understand that the region is stronger if Mount Vernon is stronger, but we have to do our part. We can't continue to be um, uh, play the eternal blame game, but we have to put our shoulder to the wheel and we have to push 
our greatest enemies have come from within our own borders and that's us fighting against each other and and that can't continue and so we are hopeful <laughs> um during this election season that we will get not rubber stamps but people who are critical thinkers um people who are not looking for the current position just to be a stepping stone to the ultimate position that they're looking for, but people who really wanna to come together and work together. And my message to the voters is checks and balances is not electing someone who hates the people who are in office right now. Checks and balances is high, uh, electing someone who has a loyalty to Mount Vernon, who has a vision and who understands what their role is. Um, in city government and will play that role. Policies and procedures and, and boundaries are the checks and balances. It should not just be the personalities. You, you vote, pe you elect people who hate each other, but then you say you want us to work together to move Mount Vernon forward. And that's kind of hard to do. Well, we thank you very much, Mayor. We wish you the best. This was very informative for the Pelamites that were here. And uh, thank you, thank you. And we're accessible. You know, I don't know everything. The things I know, I know really well. And the things I don't know, I know that better. And, and we're looking for help. We're looking for support. We're looking for partnership. Um, and, and uh, you know, like I said, now as things are clearing up, I'm, I'm looking for more opportunity for us to really be able to come together and, and um, strengthen our region, really strengthen our region. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.